is interesting in how we examine life according to principles that we dictate to ourselves or that we make applicable of our society based upon legal, civil, moral, and ethical actions and reactions determining how we will relate to each other in relationships one to another. Most of life itself is about relationships. You have a relationship to oxygen. You take in oxygen, you expiate or expel carbon dioxide. If you choose to operate in a way that doesn't work that way, you'll die. And that's your relationship of life. And so a principle of that relationship would be that you must breathe in order to have life. So there's always principles that apply to the kind of life that you live. Morals would be those types of principles that you adjust your life to become a moral person. Ethics would be those types of ethical codes that you use in order to make yourself into an ethical person. A religious person has a religious reason or religious law that they operate under and sometimes have religious ethics and religious code also accompanying that in order to be a religious person. Life itself has principles. Those principles will dictate the way that you interrelate to life as well as in our spiritual life because that is a part of life itself. We have principles that relate and interrelate themselves to our spiritual being that we are. And so as much as we have physical principles, we also have spiritual principles. But you see, there's also one other area, our emotional actions and reactions to those principles of life that operate in the physical and the spiritual realm. And the reason why we look at those things in operation of how they affect us is because we want to derive from life some of the greatest benefit that we can in order to have a fulfilled life, a complete life, a life that has all of our capabilities and our capacity in order to experience all that we were meant to experience in this life so that we would take out of this life the greater wealth and knowledge that we should have had in this life. And this life itself will give us the greatest opportunity to learn according to some factors that we will not have in our spiritual life to come, which is the eternal life that we will live forever and exist in a state of being that is different from what we are existing in now. And because we exist in a physical realm now, and we operate according to the physicality of that realm, we deal with certain principles that affect us physically as well as emotionally. One day, we will operate only according to those dimensional realities that operate only in the spiritual realm. And that will coordinate our actions and reactions inside of our emotion dependent upon our spirit and the spirit of God. And today we're going to see how that spirit of God makes a difference in our physicality and the way we interrelate to the physical world today as we look at basic principles of life and as we look at examining how we can learn and derive some of the greatest benefits in this life from something we wouldn't think of as being a part of this life. And that is problems. Yeah, you know, simple everyday problems. Problems that you look at and say, that's a problem. But the reality is, it's an opportunity for learning. A problem is rather designated in something else that we could look at in a different way. We could call the problem an issue and we could see that that issue has different ramifications of it. There are consequences, there are actions, there are abilities to derive some benefit from that issue. There is the capability of resolving that issue or leaving the issue as it is. So there's a lot of variety. When we take what we would normally list in commonplace terminology and call it a problem, and yet examine it closely and we see it as an opportunity if we resolve it to examine it carefully for what God intended it to be and not what we think it's meant to affect us as. Because in the emotional realm, we could call it a problem. But you see, in the spiritual realm, it's really an issue because you have no problems. You are guaranteed life. You are guaranteed sustenance. You are guaranteed income. You are guaranteed to be provided for by the Almighty God who created heaven and earth. Well, with that in our background and our resume, what do we have to worry about? And yet, you know as well as I do, 
Of course we do. Of course we have our emotional roller coaster ride sometimes affected by the things that go on in our life that causes some turmoil to our life that really is part of the principles of life of looking at them in a different way so we'd be prepared to say I'm not seeing a problem I'm seeing a benefit and so looking at these benefits that we can get from the problems and resolving to call them issues we have already gone through a couple of them and in those two we see that the benefit is that one of the problems that we can look at is that when we see a problem we get more grace from God in the reality of knowing that the problem comes from the person who is showing us what the problem is. God. God said he would give to us wisdom. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God who braideth out, but give it to all men liberally. That in and of itself should be the resolution of every issue that we have in life. We should go to God, find out from God what he wants us to do, what he wants us to say, what he wants us to be, how he wants us to deal with it, how he wants to talk to us, how he wants us to relate to it. A lot of people operate according to the generalizations of the Spirit. They say, oh, well, I'm waiting on the Spirit to lead. Well, you know, okay, you know, wind blows, you know, somewhere it goes, you know, and we don't know where it's coming from, where it's going, so choose everyone led by the Spirit of God. So sometimes, in some ways, people have limitations upon God placed not there by God himself, but placed by man himself in the realization that sometimes he wants to do things not necessarily in God's timing, but in man's timing and necessarily not in the way that God would have taught him by way of speaking directly to him and showing him the wisdom of it, but by way of the experience of not knowing what God is saying. Because God is very clear. He said, look, I'll whisper in your ear. I'll tell you to go right. I'll tell you to go left. I'll tell you to go forward. I'll tell you to go stand still. I'll tell you to do nothing. I'll tell you to wait. But are you listening? And that's where the Spirit of God comes into every issue and situation and problem in our life to make it the resolution capability if we would listen to what the Spirit says. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit of God says. We are told. And so it's not a matter of sometimes when you hear people say, well, you know, we're just kind of waiting on the Lord to see what, he, what he's got in mind. I'm sorry, the Lord operates in the now. Today is your day of salvation. Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Today, God has a word for you. He wants to tell you directly what he wants you to do. If you haven't heard that word, stand still and learn. And that's why we study principles of life. Because you see, we hear a lot of things that, yeah, it sounds good. You know, okay, you know, and the, the person telling us is wise. You know, we elevate them and we say, oh, well, you're waiting. Oh, yeah, okay. Me, I don't want to wait. I want to know today. Do I go forward? Yes or no, Lord? Yes. Okay, I'm going forward. Do I stand still? Yes or no, Lord? Yes. Okay. But let your yes be yes and your no be no. So be careful when you hear things because in the hearing thereof, let the Spirit of God take you to the Word of God to apply it to you personally as He directs you individually how you would make it real in your life even as we take these principles. Because a moral man can come up with a moral solution. A ethical man can come up with an ethical solution. The righteous man will come up with a righteous solution. We can say the biblical man will come up with a biblical solution. And yet they could all be wrong in what God is telling you to do. Why? Simple, because you see, even though we can take the book, and surely this is our handbook and our heart book and everything that we need is contained here in the scriptures thereof because it is called not just the word of truth so if we needed a basis for the foundation of all truth we can find it here in the scripture because it's called the word of truth but it's also called the word of life and it's also called God's word it's also called the word of God and it's also the personification of God himself in that the physical form of the word of God would be Jesus and Jesus being that physical form is the person whom we serve and we follow after and we become like them to. So we would become that which is the embodiment of the Word of God Himself as we are dealing in life today in our physical world. So that we would know the Word of God and be able to apply the Word of God as God gives us utterance unto the person that's receiving the Word of God by the same Spirit that is teaching is the same Spirit that the person must be hearing so that they would hear the Word of God as it's being spoken to them from the person that's initially using, sharing, and relating the Word of God to them by the Spirit of God Himself. So it all boils back to God, bottom line, talking, man, listening. And that's why 
principles are good, but you have to apply them. And the Spirit of God has to make application in your life to them. And so when we see the problem, we've recognized already that we need to get more grace from God and go to God to recognize what, where, when, how, why, and everything all about the issue that God is bringing before our eyes that we should see, our ears that we should hear, and our hands that we should understand how to handle the Word of God. The second benefit that we learn from every issue that comes up in life in the principles that we are talking about of looking at them as problems, oh my God, we got a problem for you, is that we come to a place of self-examination. We see if the problem is our fault or if there's a reason why there's a problem that may exist within ourselves. For instance, not hearing from God. If a person isn't hearing from God, they can spiritualize it and say, well, you know, the Lord's not talking right now. The Lord isn't shutting up. We are. It isn't that God has distanced himself or that we're distant from God. That's been resolved. It was taken care of in the atonement or the atonement of God on the cross, dying for our sins to remove that barrier with which we were keeping ourselves from hearing God because God would only intervene in certain occluded and occluded occasions with which God chose to intervene in the actions of man through those avenues in which he chose to make himself known, which was through prophets and kings and eventually through his own begotten son that he said, this is my son in whom I will please. And by the word of God that he was speaking, we are made known that this is God's word being spoken and that God's word spoken in and of itself, if we wanted an example of it, would be Jesus himself by his life and everything that he did because he only did those things that were pleasing to his father and he only did those things that he saw his father doing. So the personification and the realization of the practicality of the word of God being made alive is Jesus himself. Look at his life, you see the word of God. Simple. Really? Not so. But that's why we examine ourselves, because if we wanted to see what perfection was, we can take our direction from Jesus. There it is. Perfection was made manifest to us. So that causes self-examination of we looking at ourselves to see what we can derive from this issue that's come up in our life that we aren't like unto God. We aren't like Michael, my name. We aren't likened unto the Son of God whom we see in the form of Jesus, whom we see as Jesus being the second part of the Trinity, being God himself. And so now we've come to a place where we realize there's more to these benefits that we can get from the Word of God. There's more to these benefits that we can get from the principles of God. There's more to these benefits we can get from ethicals, from mores, from, oh my God, all these things, if... We listen to what the Spirit of God says. So I pray that God give you the Holy Spirit without measure. That He pour out upon you His ability to remove all hindrances that cause you not to understand or to comprehend the fullness that God wants you to have. Because the reality of what your life should be is overwhelming, overflowing, overcoming life in every situation circumstance that you face. You should have joy that is your strength. That you'd be able to walk and talk and live the life that Jesus wanted you to have from the very beginning of the foundation of the world before your body was ever created that he had written you down and already foretold everything that was going to happen in your life because he'd already seen it. Now, how that works? Good question. That's God. Not you, me. But it's the reality of being able to exist outside of time and then being able to look inside of time and then being able to differentiate between the two and tell us what's going to happen before it happens so that we would know that he is God and not just a figment of our own imagination. So in deriving this third benefit, we see something interesting about that. That means there's a benefit of new insight into Scripture. That's because by going to God, in number two, the benefits that we get from getting, or from self-examination, and for benefits from number one of going to God, then we come to the conclusion that we need the Holy Spirit to give us insights into the scriptures. We need to look at the Bible as the Word of God as what it really is, and how it applies to not just our own life, but to the individual circumstances of the problem and the issue that we're facing currently at hand. And you could put it down on a piece of paper and you could write down every scripture you want to right next to it and still not come up and derive yourself from the right conclusion to the issue at hand of what you're dealing with. Unless 
as we say in the Word of God, the Spirit quickeneth to you. Now, what's that mean? Quicken. Your heart skipped a beat. You went, oh, I got it. I was quickened. Wow. You know, your your heart started racing. Your emotion started flowing. Your adrenaline started running. Your little glands back here started secreting your little fluids and they started going into your heart and started going into your bloodstream and they started getting you to breathe faster and you started to begin to talk faster you started to get wild up and it wasn't just an energy drink. <gasps> it was the power of God. No, it's not a power. It's the Spirit of God. He's a person, not a power. He has power. Yeah, you know, I mean, he's a rat of creation, you know, a little bit of power there. <laughs> but the point is, the Spirit of God causes us to be made quickened unto the direction of God by His sovereignty of choosing to cause us to redirect our lives in the intention and the purpose He wants us to, which is always back to Jesus. If the Spirit of God is trying to tell you something and lead you in some way other than pointing back to Jesus, I suggest to you that your emotions, like this pair of glasses, has covered up the direct observation of what? you were seeing. And somewhere on those glasses are written anything but Jesus. That's why you're seeing something the way you are. You have something covering the purity of your sight that God would say, open up the heavens, I want them to see Jesus. And that's the bottom line of what the Spirit of God does. He causes us to remember all things whatsoever the Spirit of whatsoever Jesus has told us. The words aren't his own. They come from Jesus. And Jesus is the Word of God, so they come from God the Father speaking directly to us in the form and the manifestation of the Word of God in the physical form, Jesus himself. And his words being made alive as the Spirit quickens them to us. And so we see, maybe, the benefit of new insight in Scripture. Vast areas of Scripture will never be meaningful to us unless we go through the experiences for which they give insight. Hey, being born again? Yeah, that's a nice word. Been written there for centuries. Matter of fact, all the people for out oh, 2,000 years been talking about born again. But were they? It's funny. For a while, people were just following Jesus. They didn't use the word born again. Now lately, we hear in the 70s and maybe even the 60s the beginning of the use of the word born again. Didn't hear it a lot in the turn of the century. I'm sorry. There were a few Christian writers, but being born again was not a big deal. Born of above, you know, you could hear Spurgeon say. But born again, not so much. <coughs> you could hear it maybe a little bit in utmost, <coughs> but not so much. Toes are yes. So you see, being born again was a new phenomenon in the sense of emphasized by the Spirit of God to realize something that was lacking in the Christian world, in Christendom itself, where it had gotten so religious, it had left out one aspect of Christianity. The Spirit of God in us not just with us. And so we see that it was for this reason that God allowed all of his servants in Scripture to experience conflicts. And it is for this very reason that we go through them as well. That the Spirit of God may make application to us to cause us to learn more about how to apply the Scriptures in our life as we learn about life through experiencing it with the Scriptures in those areas of life that we are dealing with that match that with which we are reading in the scripture. We actually live out, as it were, the Bible as a character. We are the main character in our own Bible. We are the volume of the book, so to speak. Jesus in us, revealing to us that with which our Bible, we ourselves being the chapter, verse, and title of it, would be that manifestation of God in the flesh. We would be given a new name. In their flesh dwells the Son of God. Whatever you could come up with in Hebrew for that word. Or Greek, if you want to play with that one. But notice the basis of this in Proverbs 123. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. Even though David knew his conflicts were a result of his own sin, he was able to say, It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. Psalm 119, 71. How good can it be to be afflicted unless the affliction itself causes us to redirect our attention back to a better comprehension of the Word of God as we make it applicable to our lives? 
Some people say you sign your name on a blank check. Well, I, you know, frankly don't see that metaphor so similar to what the Word of God says. I'd rather use the Word of God to describe the Bible in and of itself in the way that the Holy Spirit gives us understanding to it, so that it would be the Word revealing the Word. Because if it isn't the Scripture describing the Scripture, then we're using a metaphor, a simile, or some type of manifestation that isn't necessarily directional from the Holy Spirit, but is caused by way of our inflection of our own experiences of life and changing what should be the Word of God as we are living it to our Word as we are seeing it lived in Scripture. Do you see the point of view? One perspective comes from where we're at, the other one comes from where God is at, and it draws us into the Word of God to see where it has determined we are at. And that's why the manifestation of the Spirit of God in revealing to us the Word of God is such that it causes us to say, yes, I'm in a David experience. I, I'm a, I can relate to David. Or, yeah, I know what it's like. Jesus died and suffered, you know, and man, I've been suffering for the sake of the kingdom of God, and he told me about it, and you're living that portion of scripture out. Or you find yourself like Stephen, the martyr, you know, who looked up and saw the heavens opened up, and you see something opened up in front of you, and you go, what's that? Wow, guess what? Don't be surprised you're getting stoned, and I don't mean I'm hot. You may be knocked in the head, maybe you're crazy, but if you see the heavens open up, and you see someone seated at the right hand of something that you don't understand and you can't believe what it is, it just might be, you know, a Stephen experience. <laughs> Woo! Isn't that wild? So you see, the best and first response we should have to our conflicts is to read through the Psalms and underline every verse which has new meaning to us. Then begin memorizing and meditating on these verses. Man shall not live by bread alone. Matthew 4.4. 4. Now, I don't know about you. Now, when they say we should, you know, do these things, memorization is good. But so is realization. If you are constantly using this book of the law that shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate on day and night, when thou risest up, when thou goest through, when thou walkest, when thou sittest, when thou eatest, when thou doest these things, and you're constantly using them you know, in your day-to-day -day living, then you're kind of used to the words being said, and you're kind of used to the word itself, because you're reading it, you're applying it, you're living it, you're hearing it, you're doing it, you're walking it, you're, lo you're wanting it, you're going with it, you're going to do it, you're going to live it, going to be it, going to personify it, right? That's how I memorize. Now, maybe you do like to memorize. I don't. So, I take it with a grain of salt some of the principles that are here once in a while. Some memorization, I do believe in. I believe in the five principles of God. You know, that assurance of guidance, assurance of forgiveness, assurance of answer prayer, assurance of salvation, and assurance of direction. You know, and I do believe in those five principles that navigators came up with, Larry Imes, you know, and those things that we should be teaching each other in the discipleship type of material that we could present, you know, and live accordingly because it'll make your life easier. I personally think Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 covers everything in the Bible, but that's my personal opinion. But our next best step would be to read the chapter of Proverbs each day that corresponds to the day of the month and ask God to reveal new principles that we can apply to our particular problem. <clears throat> Me, myself, I live Proverbs. Really. I sat down and took every proverb and lived it. It's not easy. It was pretty weird. It led me into, you know, kind of an interesting kind of legalism for a while. Kind of dove into a little bit of messianic stuff, a little bit, you know, not really too much messianic because, you know, what's a Jew to do? <laughs> I already know Jesus. Oh, well. But the point is, living Proverbs, reading Proverbs, and applying Proverbs is good. They are pro-verbs. They are pro-ways to be. Proverb. It is something that is an action verb of a manifestation of a word that is something that is good for you to do. Just call Proverbs good for you to do and you'll get the word in and of itself just if you read it in English and kind of interpreted it as an English way of looking at it. Don't always go by what you think is someone else's interpretation of a word because you said, oh, well, guess what? Daniel Webster sat down and decided to write up a dictionary according to what he thought was the right words and the right meaning. That was Daniel's idea. I'm sorry, one man determining the usage and comprehension of any word at any point in time is still one man's opinion as opposed to and likened unto Maimonides sitting down at Rambam saying guess what this is the way that Judaism should be structured because I'm going to take all the rabbinical literature and I'm going to say instead of the verbal law we're going to make it into a written law we're going to coordinate it and we're going to call it into this codified way of life that we call it by Maimonides or Rambam's Talmud, you know, Talmudic reasoning literature, and we got all of it, you know, in kind of like one big giant volumes 
of material that now you know is coordinated. And the same thing's true of those that have done other things like that that have taken a big body of work and said, well, this is this is what it is. And people have said, well, yeah, we agree. You know, kind of like Joseph Smith did with the Mormons and kind of led them way out into left field. Sorry, but you know, you could have taken the Book of Mormon and read it as you know a nice book. But when you started putting doctrines and covenants with it, wow, somebody pulled the wool over your eyes. Because any Mormon that reads Doctrine of the Covenants knows that's kind of wacky khaki. They get a little carried away with some of that, you know, stuff that they try to pull Masonic kind of temple stuff into it. You know, and they get mixed up with some of the other cult stuff that they've added to what originally Joseph probably did was just writing the book in the first place. They wanted to reinforce kind of a purity idea as Catholics try too. And, you know, Jewish thought is more like, well, we know where you got that from. <laughs> Been around, done there, seen that. You know, it's like, didn't work for us, won't work for you. Good luck. And so that's what happens when one person determines the interpretation of an application of the collective works of a material that they are codifying into one source. That's why we have a Bible that's written by 44 authors or so many authors that you can, you know, kind of say, you know, you want to argue Daniel, it's only one author, but you could say that, you know, you want to go with parts. I don't care if there was one or three, it doesn't matter to me, because it was still the Holy Spirit inspiring that person to write the book as it is, the way it is, where it is, such as it is. And that's what I call integral specificity, is that that's my way of examining scripture and theology. Instead of systematic theology, I call it integral specificity, and I use it for the voluminous work itself being that whatever it is you got in your hand is the one that God had in his mind to plan and that in and of itself whichever interpretation you're using whichever variation you're using however it is because it's the spirit of God making application to you then it is specific to the item that you are using at that moment in time and God is coordinating it in your heart to cause you to come to him and know him in a personal and intimate way so the realization of the Integral specificity of the Spirit of God working in the Word of God is that the realization knows that God Himself can intervene in whichever work of that Bible you're using. And it doesn't matter whether it's King James or New American Standard or any of the other ones. Even some of the weirdo ones, you know, that God can still interject Himself if He chooses to, which still boils back down to sovereignty issues, which you could get into a theological discussion about. But getting back to problems and interpretations, we're realizing that insights into scripture means that everybody gets an insight. So how do you know the truth? By the Spirit of God in you. By the Word of God to you. By God giving you understanding, as he said, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, and it doesn't say man. Now it's true that there's in the multitude of words, you know, or multitude of counselors, there's, you know, word is established, you know, established. That doesn't mean that it's you know necessarily accurate, but it's established. You, know, you could kind of like get a bunch of people together and see how they agree. You could vote on it and see how democracy works for you. It's kind of how Judaism came up with rabbinicalism. Sorry, it's kind of like off to the left field. Because you have to make applicable to you the word of God by God himself. At one point in time, somewhere in your life, when you have a problem, you're going to deal one-on-one -on -one with God. And that's why the benefit you'll get is realization that all of Scripture boiled down to one-on-one. -on -one. Every character in the Bible you read about had a one-on-one -on -one experience with God. They had to. Because the people around them, the things that were going on to them, the circumstances of their life were still making them, forcing them, causing them to come back to one-on-one -on -one with God. Because God is one and He's jealous. He wants nobody else around involved in your life except you. You and your life is involved in him and his life. And that's why he's making you into the image of his son. So that he can have his life in you and you could have your life in him. So that you would have life when the eternal life that we are going to experience comes about and you are brought out of the physical dominant life you're living into the spiritual reality of the life you will be living in the eternality of God. And knowing him is why we're going through these processes of life in order to derive the benefit of arriving to the place where he can reveal to us the truth. And we can be blown away with how much volume of knowledge and wisdom we could learn if we would apply principles in our life to examining them according to the Spirit of God and the Word of God 
as he teaches us through the scriptures to live out those portions of them that are applicable to our life and that we would see even in the very books themselves some of them being ethically driven or morally driven or even interpersonal relationship driven like Proverbs that we can do them that we can live them that we can be them you are a living proverb of God a third step would be the reading of biographies in Scripture and visualizing their circumstances in the light of what we know and we are now experiencing. There had no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will, with the temptation, also make a way you escape that you be able to bear. You can't bear what God will tempt you with, so don't go there. God will give you something bigger than you can handle. God always gives you something bigger than you can handle. But he gives a way to deal with it that is his way and not your way. Your way is I can do it with God and all things are possible. No, his way is I will do all things and you're not possible to do it without me. For without God it is impossible to please him. Without faith it is impossible to please him. Without God you can do nothing. But with God all things are possible. That's what Jesus said. Bottom line, you can't do it. Every temptation you see come at you, guess what? If you survived it, it wasn't you. I'm sorry. You, know, you aren't really that good at knowing, rowing, flowing, showing, developing, recognizing, or even the application of principles, ethics, mores, or standards that have a spiritual initiation that cause a physical ramification that involve your emotional base to cause you to stumble and fall through the area of temptation. You will be lessened so as you grow in the knowledge of God and you recognize the problems or the sins or the temptations that you go through as being something from God to bring you to God, to grow you up in knowing God so that you would not run from Him when you recognize that something is happening in your life, but you would go to Him in every situation of life, taking from that a principle of go to God. Go to God. Ask, you shall receive. Seek, you shall find. Knock, the door will be opened. Wherefore, seeing we are also encompassed by about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which so easily besets us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. You have been given purpose, direction, inflection. You have been given whispers in your ears. You have been given circumstances in your life. You have been given a problem. What are you going to do with it? Look at the Bible. Look at the circumstances. Get some meaning from that. Take Proverbs. Live accordingly. Take some meaning from that. Take some memorization of scriptures. Take some meaning from that. But in all three of these areas, one which would affect the body, one which would affect the soul, one which would affect the spirit, you still need to be made whole with the mind of Christ, which is Jesus himself saying, Father. Knowing the scriptures, he was able to rebuke Satan was tempted of the devil and he was able to come back with answers for everything that Satan would come at him but when God had a will for Jesus to do Jesus still had to come to the Father and say Father not my will but thy will be done so there's a more to an issue or a problem than just the acknowledgement in those three areas and those three principles of solving them or deriving a benefit from them in the memorization of scripture, the application of the characters of the Bible as they are living through your way of living out your life, or Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. Um, you could probably pull some from Deuteronomy and Ecclesiastes. Well, I started to say Ecclesiasticus. Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiasticus. <laughs> oh, cuss. <laughs> cuss what? Cuss this? Cuss everyone. But the point being is that deriving derivatives are only derivatives. They are pulled from not applicable of that which is the whole. So you see in the volume of the book, when you talk to God, you're going to be given Jesus himself in directing you as God said he would. There is no to uh, trust in the Lord with all thy heart, may not to thy own understanding, but in all thy ways acknowledge him and he'll direct thy path. The direction of a man's heart is his own, but the footsteps are ordered of the Lord. As you are directed by God, God will give you the directions to go. And so you have to seek him in all these issues in the resolution of the problem so you get the greatest benefit from them. And so in deriving a benefit from looking at the scriptures in a new way, there's nothing new about it. 
it's always been a book that has great benefit to it. It has set up governments, the Bible. It has caused great inspiration to men to create morals, mores, even instigating some of their own, like Benjamin Franklin, coming up with things like a penny saved is a penny earned, you know, cleanliness is next to godliness, all kinds of derivatives from the Word of God that point to a actual benefit from doing something similar to the Word of God that might apply like the Word of God, but doesn't incorporate all of the volume of the book. It leaves God out of the equation. And so pulling some of that from the character or from the proverbials and proverbs, you know, of making your life applicable according to principles that you see is good, logically, but there's more to it because it won't always apply the principle to the person and the person and the principle may not always apply to the same set of circumstances given in the same situation because God may have something else in store or in mind according to his direction and not ours. So you see, even though God is the same yesterday and today and forever and he changes not, his sovereignty changes not in the way that he applies the scripture and that's why the Word of God tells us that the Spirit of God makes application according to as He chooses. Otherwise, we're not deriving the benefit from it. We're missing out on what we can't see in a problem that God can see is a benefit to us if we would just recognize that He can bring our ability to apply in our life that benefit as opposed to that problem and that consequence, if we would let God direct us through the problem to the solution and apply the resolution of it so that we would get the complete benefit from it and we would experience all the knowledge and wisdom that would come out of what we used to call problems that James calls trials and tribulations, that the Bible calls opportunities for learning, that the Word of God says to you is no temptation taken you but such as is common to man, and that God has chosen these things to bring correction, to bring doctrine, to bring reproof, to bring really the knowledge of himself standing in the midst of your circumstance and saying, follow me, take my yoke upon you and I'll take yours. Because that's really what Jesus has done. He's taken every problem you've experienced under the sun and already solved them. You just need to find out what the solution is that he's already come up with for you. It's already there. Now, the question is, do you want the benefit from going through this life? Or do you want to be just a liability in this life of always complaining about life and never finding the fulfillment of your life in having an answer to every man for the hope that lies within you and the reason for the joy with which you are able to look at a problem face to face and say, Oh death, where is thy sting? Ha! Oh problem, where is thy, thy curse? Ha! Oh Satan, where is thy power? Ha! Oh God, what a joy you've given me to be able to go through life, really we could say without any problems but with opportunities for learning because the benefit of looking at a problem as an issue and recognizing that a principle can be derived from it is that you begin to look at life as a experience meant to be enjoyed by employing that with which God has already given you the gift of the Holy Spirit <laughs>